scripture reading today is taken from Romans, the eighth chapter, verses 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or darkness or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, good morning. It's great to see everyone today. Thanks, Mike, for reading that and for the songs, and Mike always does a good job of trying to plan the songs around the lesson and bringing it all together. I'm excited for next week. Next week, the seniors are going to be here to talk about some things, and it's always a joy to watch them as they are people who have grown up here. We saw them when they were really little. And then all of a sudden, I don't know how, but every single one of them gets taller than me. And it's amazing to watch how they develop and how much they grow. And so I'm excited about that next week, getting to listen to some of them as they do this. This passage is uh, one of my favorites. There are hundreds of favorites, but this is one of my favorites. Um, And I don't know if you have tried to prepare lessons before, but a lot of times when you prepare a lesson, you think you know what it's supposed to say and where you're going to go with it, and somehow it doesn't go there. It just takes off and goes a whole other direction. So hang on. There's a key phrase in this if God is for us. And that just struck me. If God is for us, what would that mean? What would that matter? Does it make any difference at all? Have we gotten so used to just going through things that, well, we're pretty much got to handle our life and deal with all the difficulties and handle all the battles and everything else. And, you know, if God is for us, what makes the difference? Well, his next three questions come after this. If God is for us, then who can be against us? Who can bring a charge? And who can condemn? Well, the good answer is there's not anybody else. And the bad answer is we can. No, we do that a lot. We're the ones that does that to ourselves. We can be against us and we can sabotage ourselves and we can cut ourselves down and we can tell ourselves how terrible and awful we are. We really don't need anybody else to do that. We do a great job of that. And by the end of the time when we've been looking at we're so demoralized, we don't even like ourselves anymore. And, And we don't even know how to deal with all of that. And so when you start looking at it, we can be the ones that does away with this scripture. We can have this selfish ambition. That fills our heart first and all the stuff that we want and that we've got to have. It can be things that we've got to get. Who can be against us? Well, whoever's in the way of getting me all the things I want. And so the answer comes down to be a lot of people can be, but really they don't matter because if God is for us, The rest of the people don't matter. We can allow people to become more important, but 
I mean, really, seriously, who is going to stand in the way of an almighty God? There isn't anybody who stands in the way of an almighty God. And the reason is because he loves us, because he's there, because we know that God isn't against us and that we are loved. And we know that because Jesus died on the cross. And because of his death, God did not spare his own son, but freely gives us all things. What an amazing thing he's trying to say here. Jesus is the one who died, the one who rose, the one who lives again, the one who is at the right hand of God interceding for us. Can you picture him up there right now? He's the one who's there. He's the one who's watching. He's the one who's there. And so who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? Well, you know how it is. And maybe you've got people that you love. There isn't anything going to come in between you and those people that you care about, those people that you love. And then he says, well, what kind of physical disaster would come in the way between us and the love of Christ. Well, how about a worldwide pandemic, right? <laughs> how about a time when you have to stay home? Sometimes for a few weeks, sometimes for a few months, sometimes for an entire year, and then still trying just to be able to get back and still trying, can that separate us from the love of Christ? Not unless we allow it. Now, sometimes we might get discouraged because, you know, watching on that little screen, we need the people around us. But it doesn't separate us from the love of Christ. He says there's a lot of disasters that can happen. And all of those disasters don't really matter. Paul says we've been threatened by death all the time. And so whether it's life or whether it's death, we're always under the threat of death. And it just seems like it becomes part of living. We're being killed all day long is finally his assumption or his way of looking at life. Death and life really don't matter because we've been on the edge so long, we really don't even notice anymore. And so he talks about this danger that we have of what could happen. It reminds me of when Jesus went to send out the 12. He had appointed them and, and chosen the 12, and then he goes to send out the 12. And he sends them out saying, I don't want you to take anything with you. Well, why would you send somebody out unprepared? But that's what he does. He sends them out completely unprepared for everything that they're going to need in their life, because what he's trying to say is, don't worry, God provides for you. And if God provides for you, then that's the main thing. And as he looks at you being sent out, no extra coat, no extra shoes, no extra anything, you just go and expect that you'll be taken care of. He says in this verse 16, behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. There's some scary passages, aren't there? I mean, if we really take this thing seriously, there are some scary passages. And so he sends them out without adequate provisions. And then he says, oh, by the way, there's an enemy. You're going to be like a sheep in the midst of wolves. How many of you have seen wolves? Not very many in Arizona. So not something we're familiar with as a threat. It does sound dangerous. Wolves are always in a pack. They don't hunt alone usually. So they're in the pack and they will surround whoever it is that they're trying to get. 
Um, you can't watch your back all the way around you. And so as they circle, they can go in and get closer and closer and closer until they're able to start. And they basically tear somebody apart. That doesn't sound like a lot of fun. But that's the way wolves are, is they pull that person apart from every different direction to try to destroy him. And so he says, I want you to be wise as serpents and harmless in doves, as doves because I'm going to put you in the middle of it. Ow. He says, they're going to deliver you to courts. They're going to be flogged and you're going to be in the synagogue. You're going to be dragged before governors and kings. And don't be anxious about it because I am putting you there because I need a voice there. I need someone to speak there. And don't worry about what to say. It would be nice if he'd take away the threat, but he didn't. In fact, that's what we see in people as we look at Peter and John, as we look at Paul and Silas, and then we remember, wow, those guys were incredible in how they stood up to people, even though they were in prison, they had been beaten, they went through all of these things, but they spoke up for Jesus and for who he was. If God is for you, then is it really about survival? And when they did those things, other people believed. And that's what made all the difference. Other people believed because they were willing to suffer. There's no wolves, but there are dangerous times. And so I want you to realize that there are Wolves everywhere, not the kind that we see like this, but there are so many issues that are facing the church right now and that are facing us as Christians. And I don't talk about them all because why would we bring those up? Let's not bring them in if they're not here yet. And yet at the same time in some classes and in some of the things that we need to do, yeah, we're having that conversation. I appreciate Joel talking with the teens about some things that are going on in our day and age. And he's having some real honest conversations because there's a lot of disagreements and things that come up about race and about anger and about violence and we need to be careful with those. There's a lot of things that come up about sex and about same sex and about transgender and about all the other initials and labels that just fill in here, okay? And the church is in the middle of that. And there's all the false teaching that is always around. Some about women, some about music, some about not having to have a death of Jesus in order to be saved. Yeah, that's a whole new one that's coming your way. But we need to be careful with those things. And we need to know how to help people through those things. And we need to understand what it means to be the one who helps in those things and stand strong in those and not become the wolf. hard to do. The people need a savior. They're prodigals. We usually think of it like this. That poor wolf. I mean, he's come in and there's a wolf among the flock. Oh no, it's terrible. We better make sure there's a wolf among the flock. Yeah, that is not what this passage says. This passage says we are the sheep among the wolves. 
And it's really hard to find a picture of that. And especially where the sheep is still standing and where the sheep is doing well and able to say his defense of who Jesus is. Because I think our fear becomes, oh no, there's a wolf among the sheep. Well, that's not where Jesus is going to put us. He's going to put us as a sheep among the wolves. And he says, that's where I want you. That's where you stand. That's where the danger is. And so it's all backward. I want you to realize that we may be the ones putting the wolves in danger. And that's really more what it's about. I found this picture this week, and I don't know if it speaks to you like it speaks to me, but I, that's just fascinating to me. The potential that's there, the danger that's there, and yet the calm of the person that just says, stop. We know how dangerous it is. Is that life and death? Oh, absolutely. But if God is for us, then you can't come any closer, Satan. You can't touch me. God will stop you, and he cannot go any further. And we see it in Scripture. We see it around us. And so when you get in danger, don't panic. Just hold. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, and I'm sure it felt exactly like this. He was sent or driven by the Spirit into the wilderness. And what do you think that felt like as he's looking into the eyes of evil itself? the one who's eternal, the one who has always forever been evil. And as he looks into the eyes of evil itself, it's like God holds him motionless. And Satan comes with all of his temptations that he can give. And Jesus says, I don't live by bread or threats. He says, I don't put God to the test and I don't worship anybody else. If God is for us, and everything is a threat, but he's still standing. And after 40 days, he walks out of the wilderness full of power. It's Judas among the twelve. He was there on all of the inside secrets, right? I mean, he knows all the backstory behind what's going on, just like at church. I mean, he knows all those secrets, secrets like grace and redemption, and he knows, and well, he didn't understand much of it, but he knows all that stuff going on behind the Example and behind what Jesus is doing, and he knows what they would, where they would be. He knows Jesus is going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he knows he can betray him, and he brings soldiers with him, and he comes up and he gives Jesus the kiss, and he, what's he going to do with all of this inside information? He's going to sell it, right? Give it away. Give it to the enemies against him who are standing there right ready to kill him, and they will. But there are no inside secrets. I mean, really, uh, Jesus is going to die on a cross, and you're going to fulfill it. That's the inside secret. The secret is there's a God who loves and has grace. That's really the secret. And so we keep his commandments and we love and God loves us. And that's the secret. So let them use everything they know against us because that's it. 
What else is there to know? First Peter talks about Satan as a roaring lion looking for people he can devour. But that's not us. He's looking. We believe in God's Word, and we have His promise, and we have His Holy Spirit. And so while He is looking for someone to devour, the rest of the passage says, The grace of God who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Yeah, and so we sit inches from danger with the peace of Jesus. The psalm that we like to quote so much, that gives us so much comfort in verse 4 says this, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And David understands what it means to have enemies. He was one of the greatest warriors. He had Saul chasing him for most of his early life. He did incredible things. He had Absalom, his own son, trying to kill him and take over his kingdom. He fought countless battles, and he walks through the valley of the shadow of death because of God. God who prepares a table in the presence of his enemies. Not away from them, doesn't remove them. So I think basically we better get used to this. That's where we sit. Don't let it scare you. God doesn't want us afraid, but he may not take away the threat. There is one other major thing that happens with this. If God is for us, then we repent. Then we change, then we fix our life, then we respond to him. And Jesus tells this story about this great son who has grown up at home and has a father who does well and an older brother. And uh, it is so amazing to watch this story unfold. And, you know, dad's getting older and the son wants his inheritance. He gets it goes to the foreign land, he takes his money and he spends it on loose living and he sinned and he did bad and he did everything that you can imagine that he could possibly do. He becomes the wolf. And then there's famine and then there's no money and then there's lost friends and then he's poor, and then there's pigs. And he decides he doesn't want that anymore. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. And while he was still passing a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. If the Lord is with us, we repented a long time ago because we would never do that. We came to God like this, and 
We have been to the bottom and we have fought our way back. And yes, there have been some embarrassing things and some sinful things. And yes, we have wasted the resources that he gave us and we don't have much left. And maybe that's where you still are. And we become a threat to everything that is Christian. And we do it to ourselves. And so drugs and alcohol and pigs and this emptiness that comes inside of us when we're trying to battle all of this and make our own way and stand up for ourselves, and we suddenly decide, no, I just want to go home. And then God gives us this. He's the Father who runs who runs to meet his son. He had considered his son dead, but then he comes back and he repents and he wants to be the hired servant and the father loves him back and he welcomes the wolf home. And he makes him a sheep. And you realize he doesn't use wolf tactics on a new sheep that has come back when he's trying to give him grace. Because it would be very easily to surround him and find out, well, what all did you do wrong? How much evil have you done? Don't you realize how bad that is? Let's put him on probation. Let's not allow him to do anything. Let's stand against him to make sure he's somehow possible going to be worthy of being back in the family again. And we rip to shreds. No, that's wolf behavior. But the son repents, and the father gives him more than he asked for. But that was last week's sermon, so we're not going to do that one again. He accepts him back into the family. And as you read the story, he accepts him back into the family in spite of the older brother, which is the new shark the person on the inside of the family, the danger that surrounds him. It's not gone. It's still there. And so Romans 8 ends like this. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, or depth, or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In all of these things, we are more, more than conquerors. Because he loves us. And there is a battle that goes on. And we can be sure that nothing separates us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. No dimension, no other thing, no power at all, no past. And we've had one before and we've done things before. No future that we're going to plan for ourselves. There is nothing that separates from the outside that would separate us from the love of God. And there is nothing inside of God that is ever going to separate us from him either. And we realize the danger in order to realize the power of God. Because that's where we are. There is the danger of total disaster 
and there is the possibility of eternal life and forgiveness and peace. And it's where we live. And so if God is for you, what's possible? It's possible you might just have to come to church every week. But that's really not the what God is for you. If God is for you, forgiveness is possible when we repent. If God is for you, salvation is possible when we become disciples. If God is for you, then the Holy Spirit can fill you when we're baptized into Christ. And we can defeat any enemy. You may have to hold in the balance for a while. But if God is for you, you are strong. And if you're not this morning, if you're feeling a lot prodigal, like my life is a mess, then we ask that you come and let us pray. And maybe you need to be baptized so that you can have this power of God in your life. Let's stand and sing.